All right, a more perfect you, the pursuit of perfection in Christ. This is lesson number six in the series titled The Deeds of the Flesh, The Deeds of the Flesh. So last time we began to examine the text of Galatians 5, 13 to 25, which is the basis of this series. And we noted the fact that in this epistle, Paul is refuting and rebuking false teachers who are disturbing the brethren with their teachings. Basically, what they were promoting was the idea that in order to maintain one's conditional perfection before God, a person had to adhere to a combination of rules and rituals which they taught, that's the important part, not, not which, what God's word taught, but which they taught, and of which circumcision was the key. Of course, what they were teaching was a salvation obtained and maintained by a system of works and law keeping. And this, of course, was in contrast to what Paul had taught them with the gospel. And what Paul had taught them, just to review was that their perfect condition before God was purchased by Christ on the cross and was freely given to them based on faith. And so in answer to their false notion that to remain perfect before God they had to keep the laws and the rituals prescribed by these men, Paul encourages the Galatians to walk by the Spirit Walk by the Spirit. They were saying you've got to keep these rituals. There were all kinds of, you know, it was a mixture of things. You know, some, some things from the Old Testament, some things from Greek uh, uh, philosophical ideas, some things that they had included. So they said you, you need to follow what we give you, the rules that we give you and law keeping that we give you. And Paul says, you know, never mind that. Once you, once you become a Christian, your next step is to walk by the Spirit. That's what you need to do. So yes, we are saved, we are considered perfect in God's eyes by faith in Jesus Christ, and we maintain that condition by walking or living according to His Spirit. Not by living up to man-made rules and religion that may look holy and pious, but have no real spiritual power. That's the thing. So for those who are saved, walking by the Spirit, or as we have said, pursuing actual perfection, is the natural next step in our transformation from lost to saved, imperfect to perfect, physical to spiritual, from children of darkness to children of light. You know, you come out of the waters of baptism, I've said over and over again, you're never, you're never going to get more saved than the moment you come out of the waters of baptism. You, you, don't, you can't get more saved. God considers you perfect at that moment. And so the question is, okay, now what? You know, I'm, I'm out of the waters of baptism, what do I do now? Well, Paul is saying, walk by the Spirit. That's what, that's what you need to be doing now. So in order to describe what the actual experience of walking in the Spirit is like, Paul begins by exposing what the polar opposite to this looks like. Again, this is not a complete list of possible sins or worldly activities. It's a sampling of the type of things that you will find in the life of one who follows or who walks in the flesh, meaning a life devoid of the spirit, a life where the flesh rules. So Paul's point here is that as a saved person, these are the type of things that no longer identify your character or your experience, and especially your activity. So he talks about the deeds of the flesh. Uh, chapter five in Galatians, let's begin reading there, verse 19. He says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. So Paul separates his sampling of fleshly activities that describe the worldly or the unspiritual person. He divides them into four groups of sins and activities and attitudes. Group number one, sexual sins. 
Since sexuality is a common trait that crosses every boundary of race, economic background, education, so on and so forth, it is a good indicator of a person's condition as far as spirituality is concerned. Everyone has sexual feelings and so how they are dealt with identifies one's spirituality or lack of spirituality. Paul says that the deeds of the flesh are evident. In other words, they are easily spotted and the most evident are the ways that people handle their sexual or their sexuality. So the sexual deeds of the flesh, when they produce um, the following, uh, excuse me, the sexual deeds are of the flesh rather, when they produce the following, as he says, immorality, uh, different Bibles translate this word in different ways. Some say sexual immorality, others say adultery. The confusion can be cleared up when we see that in the King James Version, the translators use two separate words to, to translate the two Greek words that are here. And the New American Standard translates the two Greek words with a single word. Okay. So the King James Version says adultery slash fornication. The New American Standard says immorality, sexual immorality in nature. So Paul is referring to the practice of unfaithfulness in marriage as well as the wider variety of sexual sins that include incest and homosexuality and sexual lust and so on and so forth. The term immorality covers sexual sins that one commits with others. That these type of activities are definitely a sign of a worldly or fleshly nature uh, of a person that dominates. In other words, these type of things demonstrate that it is the flesh that dominates that individual and not the spirit. He mentions impurity. The original word was uncleanness. Unclean, dirty, impure, a dirty joke. You, know, you tell a joke and someone says, is this a dirty joke? You know, because you, you know there's a difference. There's a clean joke and there's a dirty joke. Right? Well, that, this term refers to, refers to that. Um, think Howard Stern, think uh, Penthouse Magazine. Smut, coarse, vulgar, using sex in a degrading and unclean way, usually in words and actions and, and attitudes. He says, mentions sensuality. Some Bibles use the word lasciviousness. This word is similar to unclean, but with an element of aggressiveness. Another English word that helps is to be wanton. W-A-N-T-O-N, to be wanton. No boundaries, no restraints sexually to be open to and promote any type of sexual perversion without holding back. Does that sound, is that sounding like our society? Paul says that this type of sexual activity from simple infidelity to unrestrained sexual perversion, this is the mark of the fleshly person. Second group of sins that he talks about, spiritual blindness. Note that Paul doesn't include the false teachers here because they knew about Christ and salvation. They were wrong and causing harm, but they weren't completely without sight. You know, the false teachers, they, they were bringing in elements of Christianity. So it's not like they didn't know about Jesus or they didn't understand what, what, what had been taught. They simply perverted that. In their own way, they may have been trying to please the true God, but they were doing it in the wrong way. So Paul refers to those who are completely blind with the two sins that he mentions here as far as spiritual blindness is concerned. One, idolatry. Idolatry is worshiping something or someone other than the true God. Now in those days, idolatry included the worship of nature gods, the sun, river, trees, you know or the state, emperor worship in those days. Uh, Greek and Roman deities, Zeus and Apollos and all of the mythical gods and goddesses. Uh, mystical heavenly beings, 
Diana, for example, the goddess who was uh, glorified in the temple at Eph Ephesus. And then there were thousands of local and family gods and idols. Each family had their own idol. Many families had their own particular idols. Uh, the, the god Baal or Baal, B-A-A-L, Baal. This was a local god. Every city had their own version of Baal. That's why there's Baal of this city and Baal of that town and Baal of that region. You know, it was the same idea, God, uh, but he was localized. So all of this here includes the type of idolatry that Paul was referring to. Today, uh, th here's the interesting thing too. As time goes on, uh, the fleshly man continues to add new idols, new ways to commit this particular sin. So today, uh, nature itself continues to be worship. Environmentalists, I'm not saying all environmentalists are idolaters, uh, of course not. Uh, but there are some to the extent that they take the environmentalism that it trumps everything else is a form of worship. The state, relying on the state for everything is a form of idolatry. Money, materialism, when, it, when, all, the, when all your decisions, right, when all your decisions are based on how much, what's it going to cost? When, I mean, some decisions have to be based on that. You know, I'm buying a house, you know, well, how much is it going to cost? You know, can I afford that house? If it's just normal, you know, but some people, everything is based on how much. How much will this advantage me financially? And if, and, if, and if the numbers are not right financially, if the how much question isn't in their favor, they won't even consider what's going on. Mysticism continues today. Thousands of things, movements, philosophies, false religions that have taken the place of God. Today in, in our country, sports and entertainment. I mean, we spend more time and money on these than in the service and in the worship and, our, and in our relationship to Almighty God. <laughs> I mean, there are many people in this country, or in the Western nations, that spend way, you know, they spend way more money on sports than they do on, on the church. If you were to add up what they spend on sports and their entertainment of sports and get a total and then you know, ask, our, ask our, 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 our bookkeeper to add up that person's contribution, I, oh boy, yeah. I'll tell you something, the checkbook never lies, okay? The checkbook never lies. You want to know who you are? You want to know how spiritual you are? Look at your checkbook, because it'll never lie to you. So idolatry is the same now as it was in Paul's day. Anything or one that we put before God or instead of God is idolatry. So he, he you know, he mentions spiritual blindness, idolatry, one type. Another type, sorcery. Paul uses this one word as a catchphrase for all forms of occult practice. Sorcery, witchcraft, channeling, mediums, magic. All of these things are an attempt to manipulate the spiritual world by doing something here in the physical world. That's what magic is, by the way. I do something in the physical world that will somehow affect the spirits in the spirit world to do something favorable for me or unfavorable for someone else. The black arts or occult practices are wrong because they're an attempt to circumvent God's sovereignty and power through the use of man-made means. Who's in charge of the spirits? Well, God is. Magic is an attempt that we control the spirits using incantations, objects, rituals, all kinds of things like that. Prayer is our avenue to God. Our conscious effort to appeal for change, for strength, for wisdom, for blessings, 
But in prayer we know who is in control. God is always in control. That is the manner in which we breach the physical spiritual divide. We're in the physical world. How do we communicate with the spiritual world? Well, God has told us. We pray to the true God. Uh, you know, when we say in Jesus' name, that's not just some kind of formula. You know, dear Lord, help me. In Jesus' name. Well, I didn't say in Jesus' name. Well, I, I, I really meant in Jesus. That prayer I did this morning, I forgot to say in Jesus. You know, it's not a formula. The idea is, when I pray, I know I am praying to the true God because I am doing it through the agent that He has sent, Jesus Christ. I am praying through Jesus. That gives me confidence to know that my prayer is going to the right place, to the right person. So with the occult, it's the person who through some secret or dark means has obtained control and power. If then, uh, if, if uh, 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 it then is the person who wields the power, um, uh, not the unseen spirits. And so again, magic, the attempt to control the spirits through something we do here. Of course, this is not true, right? It's not possible. And it's not of the spirit, not the Holy Spirit. There are spirits out there. There are evil spirits out there. And it's a dangerous thing to try to purposefully communicate with and cooperate with them. Anyone who practices such things, no matter how slick the package, is not doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So, you know, I've heard people say, well, that person, you know, the, she's a witch, she's a white witch, she's a, and she's done some awfully strange things, and you know, there's power there, you know, expecting me to say, no, no such thing. Uh-uh, oh yeah, I believe you. Yeah, I believe there's power out there. I believe there's black power out there. I believe there's evil power out there, and I believe there are some people that tap into that here, absolutely. Yeah, I, I believe it. I'm afraid of it. I'm not going to mess with that. Of course, I understand also that John says, the spirit that's within me is greater than the spirit that's in the world. So that's my protection. Third group, sorry, I'm slowing down. Third group he talks about, divisive spirit. The first two groups are usually spotted and rejected rather quickly by Christians, but this next group of activities that identify the fleshly man are usually seen not as serious, but they are. The divisive spirit is the mark of the fleshly person just as sure as the practice of sorcery and sexual immorality are. The only difference is that we tolerate this more in the church than we do the others. If we have a somebody that comes in and, and visits with us and, and she announces that she's a witch, or some guy comes in and says he's a warlock, and they, they want to they have a chance to speak to the church, I think the elders will corral that person in a hurry and maybe want to talk to them. You know? But these particular sins, this divisive spirit thing, that's a little more difficult to put your finger on. The examples he gives, enmities. Some Bibles say hatred. The dictionary defines hatred as extreme dislike or opposition to or hostility, enmities. The question here is, what has happened to allow you to actually get to this point? Enmity, hatred, fierce opposition is of the world because it is the final result of a feeling or attitude that should have been dealt with long before but has been allowed to grow. In other words, if you hate your brother, how did you get there? What road did you take that got you to the point where you hate this brother? Well, what did you neglect doing that, that, that enabled you to go from uh, 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 a misunderstanding to uh, 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 you know, I don't like, to uh, he bothers me, to, you know, to I hate him. I mean, how, what? how did you let that get to that point? Enmity, hatred, fierce opposition. It's of the world. You have to nip that in the, in the bud. 
Most of the time enmities start with, you know I said miscommunication, that's usually where things start. And the things that I've been involved with to try to referee or try to you know, bring folks together, usually the conversation is, well you said blah, 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 you know, and the other person, well I didn't say that, you didn't? Well no, I, I said this over here. Oh, I thought you said that, you know, and that just grew. It was allowed to fester for six months. Another one he mentioned, strife. Some Bibles use the term variance. The only time this word is used in the Bible. It means to quarrel, to be at odds, to wrangle, to wrestle around over things. The fleshly person is quarrelsome. He is ready and willing to argue. He's at variance with others. You know, you know those people. Well, you better, let's get Joe, we, no Joe's here. Let's get Joe, we'll get Joe in on the committee. You know, oh yeah, let's get Joe on the committee. And somebody said, oh, not Joe. Oh man, he'll, he'll fight every point to the death. So we'll, we'll be arguing and fighting in the meeting at all. Uh, not, don't, not Joe. Yeah, that, that, that type of character that he's talking about here. Jealousy, anger and disappointment at someone else's success or good fortune. Fleshly people don't want anyone else to get ahead or get more than they have. I don't mind if you get ahead, but I just don't want you to get ahead of me. <laughs> I'm happy for your success, really I am. It's just I don't want you to succeed more than I do. <laughs> Jealousy is based in fear and insecurity and lack of trust. Jealous people tend to forget that God can provide and He does. They see themselves as the source and when they or what they have is threatened or surpassed, they feel the, the sick, I call it the sick anger of jealousy. I mean, isn't, we've all been jealous. Isn't that the worst feeling in the world when you're jealous? Oh man, it's terrible. Jealousy is dangerous because its goal is to tear down, to destroy, to bring self up at any expense. Again, he's talking about in the church. Outbursts of anger. This is self-explanatory, but the way this works is that people are not honest or open with people like this for fear of an outburst. Remember Joe? Well, he's got his brother, Zach. And so the group says, you know, uh, let's get Zach on the committee. And then people who know Zach, oh, don't get Zach, man, if it doesn't, get it, it doesn't go his way, you know, he's going to start, you know, he'll, he'll start trouble. Or don't say that around Zach, you know how he is, you know, he'll just blow up. You know the people who control everybody around them with their temper, the threat of them bursting out in anger keeps everybody under control, mom and the kids are tiptoeing, or dad and the kids are tiptoeing around that person because boy, the last thing you want is to see and face that ugly, that ugly outburst of anger. It's a, manipula, it's, a, it's a manipulation tactic that people use. Of course, there's always the damage done after the explosion. And people like this use this trait, as I say, to manipulate others to do their will. Do my way, do it my way or I'm going to get ugly. <laughs> Don't do it my way because I got a better idea or I can argue, you know, like I can come up with a better argument, or you know, let's not, do, no, we're going to do it my way because if I get mad, man, there's going to be, you know, people are going to get hurt. This is definitely not in the image and conduct of the one who suffered the indignities of the cross without complaint or an angry word. Let's face it. When, when we all compare ourselves to Jesus, absolutely, we fall short. And then he talks about disputes. Some Bibles use the word strife here, but there's a subtle difference between the previous word strife and this word dispute. The word strife refers to the one who is quarrelsome, one who is ready to fight, one who, you know, they like to get into it. The word dispute refers to one who provokes strife, strife and division and quarrels. Did you ever have one of those guys? <laughs> Some people do this through gossip. 
or an unkind word. Others do it because of their pride or foolishness or lack of sensitivity. Dispute refers to that person who causes the division with their words and actions. I mean, we've all, you know, we've all been in situations where you're at odds with somebody else and, and perhaps you've gotten to the point, you know, that, that, that situation where I said you're sitting down and you're talking to each other, trying to work it out, you know? Well, I thought you said so and so. No, I didn't say that. Well, you said, no, I, oh, well, why have we, we been arguing? Because uh, uh, Sister Josephine over here, you know, uh, said something over here and it ricocheted and it came, you know, sideways to Joe and Joe being who he is, you know, got himself all uh, up in arms. And, uh, you know, I've often said, you know, we say sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ because that's all we've got here is sinners, right? Sinners who have been forgiven. But on the other hand, you take 400 sinners and put them in a single room, you don't think there'll be trouble? <laughs> you don't think there'll be division, misunderstandings, quarrels? Well, of course. That's why we have God's word. That's why he said, that's why he's encouraging. Walk by the spirit. Pursue actual perfection. He mentions dissensions. Again, some Bibles use the word sedition. The word refers to an uprising against the government actually. Causing division by resisting authority. Some people provoke arguments, others provoke the resistance and the denouncing of leadership. In totalitarian governments led by cruel and godless people, this may be acceptable, but in the church overseen by godly elders, this is not acceptable. There are ways of getting our uh, opinions, disappointments, questions, you know, problems. There are ways of dealing with those things in the church uh, without dissension, dispute, jealousy. So, you know, there are ways that we can resolve issues without falling into this here. Factions, big group here. Eh? Sexual sins, two or three. <laughs> these kind of sins, you, you got a dozen of these. So in the Galatian churches, there were parties forming where each sided with one or the other. The church is one, therefore, to cause people to split into different camps in order to argue over various issues, this was wrong. The polarization of groups so they can be in opposition to one another is a trait of the fleshly man, not the spiritual person. We are called to unity, not party spirit. This may work in politics, but it is not a feature of the kingdom of God. Envying, King James used the word heresies. We see heresies as false doctrines, but the Greek word has another sense here, and that is to choose. So the feeling that one is better than another and a choice must be made. The promotion of one thing over another, thus causing envy in some who do not have, or do not belong to the right or the better thing or the better group. The envy of position or possessions is very much a worldly phenomenon. And in the church, it's hard, you know, because we naturally gravitate towards people who have similar tastes or similar interests, and similar age and experience. It's just natural. We tend to you know, gravitate towards those people and that's fine. The problem is when that, that group becomes a clique, and that little clique has leaders and you're allowed in, you're not allowed out, and you can't, if you go to that other group, you know, you're shunned, you know, that, that's very dangerous in the church. Why? Because our natural tendency is to, is to kind of draw towards a group and identify with a, with a group. In the church, we all share Christ and His promises equally. There's no reason or room for envy or separateness from others. We're all the same. Now, we have, we have different groups to facilitate teaching and fellowship, 
you know, we have the seniors, you know, the seniors will go on a, on a day trip uh, to, I don't know, a museum and have lunch, uh, you know, the seniors will do that. I'm not sure the teenagers would enjoy that a whole lot, or the, or the kids for Christ, you know, would like to sit on the bus for an hour as we drive out to, to the museum. That might not be the thing that they're interested in. Maybe they'd like to go to the place where they can jump, you know, I don't know what they call those things, you know, the, bounce room or whatever, you know, the, 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 your middle school kids would probably enjoy that a whole lot more than the trip to the museum with the, with the old guys. You know, and that. So we, 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 we break up into groups you know, to facilitate activities and so on and so forth. But we always have to be careful to recognize that we're still one. You know, in the classroom, we're teaching the middle schoolers that Jesus is the Son of God and that we should love one another and forgive one another. And in the seniors class, we're teaching that Jesus is the Son of God and we should love each other and we should forgive one another. So it's the same teaching, we just facilitate that teaching a little differently. The natural outcome of all of this is violence and murder, which is mentioned in the King James, but not in the New American Standard. You know, one of God's primary goals in sending Jesus to earth was to create a unity among all. Something that Peter talks about in Galatians, I'll just uh, you know, go ahead a little bit here. It says, for you are all sons of God through faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This passage refers to this problem. We're all one in Christ. This passage does not mean uh, that a man no longer has his role as a man and a woman doesn't have her role as a, as a woman. It doesn't mean that the Jew has to give up his culture or the Greek has to give up his culture. Yes, we're all different in those ways. We all have various roles to play in life depending on our, 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 you know, our background, our gender and so on and so forth. But Paul says, in Christ, however, we're all considered equal before God, not one better than the other, not the Jew better than the Greek, not the man better than the woman, and so on and so forth. So a divisive spirit expressed in these varied ways was a sure sign that the individual was still very much in the flesh and in the world, regardless of what he or she said about their spirituality. Then the fourth group, in sobriety, remember, if, if, you, <laughs> if you've lost track of where we're at, we're talking about the various deeds of the flesh here that Paul has broken down into four groups. The fourth group is in sobriety. He mentions two last sins in his sampling of activities and traits that identify the worldly person. These two refer to a person's clear mindedness and self-control. So the first one, drunkenness. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward word, meaning an addiction to alcohol. It's not mangling scripture to apply it today as not being addicted to anything. The key is not the alcohol, the key is the addiction. Addictions begin by destroying our credibility and they finish by destroying us. One who loves a self-damaging substance more than loving himself or herself, does not love God and others as well, no matter what they say. Addictions are a sign of worldliness, worldliness and not spirituality. Well, absolutely, we know that. I've, I've said this before, you know. What if I taught the exact, same, the exact same lesson as I'm teaching this morning, right? The exact same lesson and you're taking notes and okay, that's good, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I put my hand in my pocket like this and right here in my shirt pocket, you see a package of Marlboros or a can of chewing tobacco. And then you know, I closed my, and my jacket then closed. What, what would be going through your mind as I kept talking about all these things? You'd say, wait a minute, what? why is he teaching us? He needs to get a hold of his own business here before he's teaching us. It doesn't make what the man is teaching not true. It just simply lowers his credibility in teaching it. And then the second thing, carousing. The other Bible, many other Bibles say reveling, revelings. The original word refers to a letting loose. In context with drunkenness, Paul refers to drunken parties and rioting, and orgies. 
gathering together to practice and let loose immoral tendencies. So such decline in sobriety and self-control, personal behavior is a sign that one identifies with the world because there are, many, uh, there are any number of situations that encourage and applaud this type of activity in the world, but not in the spiritual kingdom of God. That's what I'm saying. The, the things that I've mentioned here, they, they happen in the world all the time. They may be happening at your job, at your work. You may be saying, wow, we go through this all the time on the shop floor, or in the office, or the classroom. You know, I have to put up with this stuff all the time. Right. But hopefully it's not a feature of what you have to put up with in church. <laughs> now I don't have time today you know, to kind of then keep going to this, the fruit of the Spirit, what, what, what we should be practicing. We'll do that as we, you know, next week. So Paul gives a warning. After having given a cross section of the four types of activities that, divine, that define the person devoid of the Spirit, and I'll put them uh, down various forms of sexual sins, spiritual blindness, divisive nature, lack of sobriety, Paul will issue a clear and decisive warning. He says, uh, he continues, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but uh, that's pretty straightforward to me. Note his reference to the list as really a sampling because he adds, and things like these. In other words, similar activities and attitudes that reflect worldliness rather than spirituality. And his warning is twofold, very quickly here. First, your activities reveal you. These type of activities and attitudes in your life reveal worldliness in you, a walk after the flesh. No matter what you say, if these are the type of things that are in your life, you're of the world, you walk in the flesh. It's like a reality check. And then the second part of the warning, the practice of these things will not lead you to heaven. In other words, if this is what you practice, they're a normal part of your life rather than what you revert to when tempted or weak. I'm not saying we don't do these things, I'm just saying, but is this our lifestyle? Is this, is this our go-to attitudes? So if you're practicing these things, then you're not in nor will you enter into the kingdom. Inheriting the kingdom means ultimately to go to heaven. For our lesson series, we could say that a person pursuing these kinds of things is really not pursuing actual perfection. Okay, so in the next verse, Paul is going to describe characteristics of a person who is pursuing actual perfection, or as Paul says, walking in the Spirit. The results are very different, and we're going to begin talking about those next week in our next section. All right, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.